Welcome, welcome, welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. I think this Monday is, uh, is a just payment in terms of the weather for the beautiful weekend that we were gifted. I hope you each and everyone enjoyed the beautiful weather and feel refreshed and renewed for the week ahead. And if you don't feel such, if you are feeling burned out or if you are in need of self-care, you can always view our past recordings on those topics on our YouTube channel. Uh, simply Google or go to YouTube and search in their bar. Um, Sean Barnes Care Patrol. You'll see a number of different videos and a channel there. There are about 70 recorded CEUs that you can view uh, and take the evaluation and receive credit. Uh, but I think the information on self-care uh, self rather is, is really the uh, point I want to make. Uh, as those of you who've been with us know, and those of you who haven't may not know, we are accredited by the Alabama Board of Nursing and also by the Alabama Board of Social Work. And they allow us to uh, provide, create, credential, and offer these contact hours to you. 1.0 hour for nurses and 1.0 hour for social workers. For social work, our hour uh, is considered live or face-to-face -face because of our evaluation process. We use a... Uh, process which is password protected uh, and that password protection we give the password at the end allows us to show to the boards uh, who accredit us that this was live that you were in attendance uh, and that that's the appropriate uh, 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 accreditation so i'll read for some of you i know are, are, are participating by phone and if you know our evaluation process you know i'll read to you now the link for today, I've posted it as well, again, in the chat room for those of you. Uh, hello, Ms. Durses, thank you for joining us. Our, uh, our evaluation link today is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters seven d is in dog l three m is in mary t is in tom n as in nancy that is our evaluation uh yes ma'am miss sanding uh, generally speaking, this would be also an appropriate hour in Mississippi. I am afraid I can't answer that, but you could reach out to your board and see if they have a reciprocal agreement with the state of Alabama board such that hours are shared between. And this is usually the case in most every state, except I believe New York and maybe Nevada, uh, because nurses, many of you travel or travel nurses. And so your hours follow you from state to state because they have this agreement for reciprocity. Uh, so uh, anyone who's wondering if this is good for another state, I, I believe that it should be, but you want to check with your state. Um, and you're welcome, Ms. Taylor, for the YouTube. Uh, and you can also see this presentation and the most recent presentations on our website, which is carepatrol.com forward slash advisors forward slash Sean, S-H-A-W-N dash Barnes with an E-S. Uh, Dr. Sipma was in clinic today and let me know that when we scheduled this, but she's such a terrific speaker that I wanted for us to have the possibility to hear her again. And part of the reason that I believe she is such a terrific speaker is that I expect that she is a pretty terrific student. And she is a fellow at the UAB Department of uh, 
neurology. And I see that she has joined us. I'm going to make Dr. Sipma co-host of the meeting and allow her to begin uh, her discussion for you all. And Dr. Sipma, when you join us, I was just saying uh, that as a student, as a fellow at UAB's department, um, I would expect that um, you uh, are privy to the latest and greatest information that we might see. Um, and so uh, in that respect, if I can get you pulled up here, and my apologies to everyone for my inability to find Dr. Sitma here among our attendees. We have about 70 people with us, which is a, a real blessing. And I, I will get you to Dr. Sitma as soon as I can find her. I think she dropped off somehow. Yeah, I'm uh, but, still here and connected, so I'm not sure where oh, I oh, so the list. You rescued but. me and you rescued everyone else. Yep. I, forgive, <laughs> forgive me, Dr. Sitma, I was just introducing you and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stop talking. I'm sure everyone would appreciate that and <laughs> well, all that you have to say today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me again. So is it easier if you I share my slide or can you? I, I think at this me? point, given my technical inability, if I could do, you know, change the slides, that might be better. Did I lose you? Because um, I don't think I can click through. Yeah. So, but I can switch over to sharing my screen. Yeah. Let me, you know what? I'll just stop my share. Let me stop. There we go. And uh, how was clinic this morning? It was pretty good. Uh, had a couple new patients, a couple follow ups. So, good mix of different things. And oh, yeah. So a little bit more too. So like you said, I'm a fellow here at University of Alabama in Birmingham uh, from California originally, grew up in uh, Central California where there's a lot of Parkinson's patients, including my grandfather who's had Parkinson's for over a decade now and is currently kind of in the end stages with dementia. And we'll get into a little bit on the dementia with Lewy bodies, which is similar, but slightly different from that. And we'll share some of those details here today. So thank you for having me again. All right, so some of the objectives here. So we'll review a little bit on kind of intro of dementias, what the different types involve, and then we'll review some of the specific, specific symptoms that come with uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. And then with the review of each of those symptoms, we'll highlight some of the available non-pharmacological as well as medication options for addressing these. And then we'll discuss a little bit on you know, end of life care and uh, how to kind of approach some of those strategies here. So with that, here's our brief little uh, overview and we'll go into cognitive changes. So when someone first comes to the clinic, essentially we're trying to figure out, you know, why are they having memory issues, right? Why are they you know, misplacing things or forgetting words or having difficulties. First thing we always do is look for treatable causes of cognitive changes. Those can be things like metabolic changes. Thyroid dysfunction is a very common one. Vitamin deficiencies like B12 in particular is implicated in memory changes. There's other things as well. So medications, recreational drug use, heavy metal exposure. So kind of getting an overall history from the patient to what are they exposed to at home or uh, you know, in their personal life in addition to the things that are on the med list that comes with them. Other things infectious wise too, we will sometimes screen for if there's other uh, criteria that they are meeting it. Again, not everyone who walks into the office gets screened for syphilis or meningitis, but if there's other clinical features, that's something that I'm thinking of in the back of my mind. Similarly, mood disorders can also present with cognitive changes. If you're not sleeping well, you aren't processing a lot of what's happened through the day. And so then that comes in of like, oh, I don't remember what happened yesterday, or there's gaps in my memory, or I have trouble focusing. And um, some of that's due to just depression and not being able to understand everything that's going on uh, coherently synthesizing that. That can also do sleep disorders, not sleeping all the way into REM and getting that consolidated uh, uh, time each night where those memories are getting laid down appropriately. And so again, kind of screening for those in our brief history and review of systems is very important when you're assessing someone with cognitive decline. 
And then that kind of leads us into how do we classify it if we ruled out one of these treatable things? Is it mild cognitive impairment, meaning there's just loss of a memory greater than expected for the age of the patient, but it's not interfering with independence? Or does it meet criteria for what we call dementia? And that's a loss of memory or other mental ability that is severe enough to interfere with daily life. And dementia is very prevalent among the U.S. population. So uh, again, there's different risk factors for developing dementia. So as you can see here, so with the less than 12 years of education, you have a higher incidence of uh, dementia amongst our population versus the more education you get that kind of is protective in the brain in some way. And again, I'm usually encouraging patients to keep your brain active as much as you can throughout your whole life. So doing you know, puzzles or ongoing education, things like that can be helpful. Uh, you know, protect your brain as much as possible from developing problems like this. Age, again, is going to be correlated with incidence of dementia and prevalence. And so uh, as you get closer to 90 or higher, then that prevalence is going to increase as well. Between men and women, slightly more women compared to men, but it's fairly equal in the 9 to 10% prevalent range. And then to race and ethnicity, we, again, studies have noted that there's a slightly higher prevalence in our Hispanic populations compared to our Black or non-Hispanic populations, and even more so compared to the white or non-Hispanic populations. And there's constantly more and more genetic studies being done with all of our different neurologic diseases. And so trying to tease out, are there specific genes that we can identify? There are a couple that are highly linked. And then there's sometimes other ones that aren't clearly causative, but maybe combination of those plus other factors can contribute. And then again, age adjusted death rates per 100,000 by state in the dementia studies. So kind of here in the South, it is kind of on the higher range uh, compared to some of the other areas. So just emphasizing again, here in Alabama, it is something that you will see in a number of your patients in particular. And then there are different types of dementia. Again, dementia is just the broad term, meaning that there's some loss of memory and it's interfering with your day-to-day -day activities. But why is that happening? So the most common ones that we see are gonna be these neurodegenerative ones. Most everyone's familiar with Alzheimer's dementia, and that's kind of what some people use interchangeably with the term dementia, but there's other specific types in particular. Similar to Alzheimer's, our posterior cortical act atrophy and primary progressive aphasia. It's just different areas of the brain are affected more by the same uh, protein abnormalities. And then dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease with dementia are both alpha synuclein abnormalities. And that's what we'll be focusing on more in detail here today. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies specifically is about 30 per 100,000 in person years and those who are greater than 65 years old. Um, Frontotemporal dementia is, again, a tauopathy similar, but slightly different to some of these other underlying processes. And then Huntington's disease also can have a neurodegenerative component to it, which includes some dementia, especially later in the course of Huntington's disease. Infectious causes most commonly are HIV and then creutzfeldt jakob disease. Um, that's prion disease, uh, similar to like mad cow is sometimes the one that more lay people are familiar with, but again, those are prion specific infections that occur. And then vascular dementia, meaning that there's lots of strokes, either large strokes that kind of uh, are on top of each other, or lots of just small chronic microvascular disease can present with some uh, you know, non-specific motor findings, whereas, you know, larger strokes, we think of, oh, like weakness and other motor deficits, but just uh, lots and lots of gradual buildup of microvascular disease can present with more of a dementia aspect to it as well. Alcohol is also very toxic to the brain and nerves and the whole nervous system in general. And with enough chronic alcohol use over time, then you can develop a dementia sort of um, presentation with that as well. So, as in this pie chart over here, vast majority of patients are going to be Alzheimer's dementia. And then vascular dementia is kind of the next most common. And then you get into smaller proportions of the other neurodegenerative processes. And then like the infectious ones are gonna be the more rare ones. And then kind of a little bit about, you know, why 
there's different classifications, different names for some of these things, because the symptoms that they present with are going to vary depending on which area of the brain is most affected in particular. Uh, so with Alzheimer's, that's mostly temporal lobe. So that's in these areas here in particular, that's a lot of the laying down of memories, recalling memories. And so they'll typically present with more of a, you know, I'm getting lost, I can't remember uh, you know, people or places or things and those sorts of things. Uh, the frontal temporal dementia, this frontal lobe up in here, is more affected in the frontal temporal dementia. And the frontal lobe in particular is important in our personality, as well as kind of your impulse control. So things that can happen with these patients is, you know, family comes in saying, this is not the person that I knew, you know, five, 10 years ago, they've changed a lot. They're either, there can be different uh, presentations too of either they're more outgoing, they're doing things they never would have done otherwise. Uh, they're making comments that are very inappropriate or there's the more withdrawn. They don't talk with anybody at all. They're just really like in the house, not eating as much and really not doing much of anything um, because they don't have the motivation that they used to have. So those are more of the frontal temporal areas in particular. Posterior cortical atrophy, like I said, is similar to the Alzheimer's and what protein is abnormal, but it's more of this occipital lobe and the posterior parietal lobe in particular. Those ones, because the occipital area is important for our vision, tend to have more of the visual abnormalities, trouble tracking objects in space or understanding what they're seeing. And so that putting together, like I'm seeing parts of, you know, a nose and eyes and all of those things and synthesizing that to understand it's a face and recognizing that face can be particularly problematic in that one. Then primary progressive aphasia is a dementia that tends to target the language centers. And so those are going to be part here back in the temporal parietal lobe and as well as kind of parts of the frontal lobe. But it's really just that language output and understanding is impaired for them, whereas their memory is OK for other types of things, just not language learned to so like shapes, those sorts of things very much intact. And then Lewy body dementias, those affect both the diffuse cortex, as well as the deep structures, which aren't pictured here, those are the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia are the important structures for our motor pathways. And so that's why we have not just the cognitive symptoms, but also a lot of other motor symptoms with this specific type of dementia. And then again, with these different dementias, the pathology varies. And so with Alzheimer's, you see a lot more of the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles of tau, which are in the neurons in particular. And so you may have heard of some of the new medications which are coming out targeting these amyloid plaques uh, specifically. And then frontotemporal dementia, it has more of a uh, TDP43 and hyperphosphorylated tau, which is similar, but not quite the exact same as the Alzheimer's type. Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, like I said, are alpha synucleans. Uh, again, a different type of protein that's abnormal. And you get these kind of uh, round, darker on stains, uh, what we call Lewy bodies, where there's a collection of those proteins. And then uh, cortical, uh, Crucell-Jacobs uh, disease, those are prions, which are the misfolded proteins. Uh, HIV causes a lot of inflammation. And because of the inflammation from the virus going on, then you get the immune system activated. And then those macrophages cause a lot of damage to the brain itself is the underlying pathology there. Alcohol, like I said, is a toxin that activates multiple different cytotoxic processes where the neurons start degenerating because of the uh, toxic exposure. And then vascular, again, it's a blood flow problem. So you're getting ischemic injury because the blood's not getting to that part of the brain, whether it's, you know, briefly, uh, just small amounts of it over time in the small vessels, or it's a larger vessel that gets a large clot and you have a large amount of the brain affected, causing permanent neuronal death in particular. And 
So a little bit more about the alpha-synuclein disorders. So alpha-synuclein is a normal protein in neurons, but various factors can cause it to become more abnormal and then clump together where it's not functioning like it should anymore. These factors that contribute to that include genetics. There are some genes that are clearly linked with this. There's environmental exposures. The ones we know about uh, for sure are pesticides, herbicides, some of the... Um, like hyperchlorinated compounds that have been contaminated in drinking water. We know, again, with certain studies that there are certain sites that have had specific chemicals that we know of in the drinking water. But there's a lot of other ones that we aren't 100% sure about yet, and we're still doing more studies on. And then inflammation is also uh, becoming a more prominent factor that we're seeing on some of the pathology in the studies. And then this is also supported by the fact that there's certain viruses. So back at the Spanish flu and post uh, influenza, you could get like a Parkinsonian sort of syndrome from that. And again, just kind of anecdotally too with uh, patients who have had some sort of other major illness or recent infection tend to, you know, kind of bring out some more of the symptoms that were maybe already there underlying. It's again, this combination of inflammation plus their genes, plus their history of environmental exposures produces this Parkinsonism, which is the degradation of the, um, the neurons that are producing dopamine throughout the brain. And so again, where these abnormal proteins are collecting are these little clumps that I showed on the last slide, which are called Lewy bodies. And then where those Lewy bodies are depositing really determines what type of symptoms occur. So you've got Parkinson's disease, which is mostly in the basal ganglia, uh, the substantia nigra, which interacts with the rest of the motor system is the main one affected in PD early. Dementia with Lewy bodies, it starts more in those cortical neurons and in the neocortex, as well as the substantia nigra, which is affected in Parkinson's as well. Multi-system atrophy is another one of the classic uh, alpha-synucleinopathies. This is kind of diffusely throughout the cerebellum as well as the brainstem. And so these patients have a lot more of the autonomic dis instability. This is lightheadedness on standing, potentially even fainting because blood pressures are dropping too much, uh, as well as like constipation, autonomic dysfunction and temperature regulation and other features as well. And then there's other ones that we consider prodromal, meaning they don't have one of these full other whole body syndromes yet, but potentially may progress to ha be having other associated symptoms. So uh, the REM sleep behavior disorder is sometimes seen in our patients 10, 15, 20 years before they develop other motor symptoms. Uh, and again, those ones are thought to be mostly just in the brain some nuclei, but not affecting the substantia nigra in particular yet. And then there's also like a pure autonomic failure symptom, which is again, more of the nerves all throughout the body. It, they aren't having any problems with the cortex, with the brainstem. It's mostly just the nerves communicating with the gut, with the ones that are controlling the blood pressure that are affected in those patients. So, yeah. So the difference between dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's with dementia really is when does the cognitive features the dementia present. So with dementia with Lewy bodies, it's at the same time or even earlier than the motor symptoms are onset is going to be your dementia with Lewy bodies versus Parkinson's with dementia is they first present with the motor symptoms, the slowness, the gait changes, the tremors, and then they don't have any cognitive impairment until at least a year after those motor symptoms occur. So this is really piecing out from the patient and from family as to like, okay, timing wise, are we able to think of a time when, you know, they only had the tremor, but didn't have thinking problems, or is it always kind of been overlapping? And about one third of Parkinson's patients do develop mild cognitive impairment. That's the, again, memory problems, but not impairing. And then those who do have the cognitive impairments are associated with a more rapid progression to dementia. And it does increase the mortality risk if they have more cognitive impairment. And so a lot of us clinicians in the movement disorder field are kind of like, it's more of a spectrum of like how much cognitive impairment versus motor impairment do you have earlier in the disease course. 
the more cognitive impairment you have, we can then have discussions with patients and family of, we expect this to maybe move a little bit faster, but everybody's a little individual in their prognosis because of other health factors as well. And so let's go through a little bit more of the details of each specific uh, uh, type of symptom for dementia with the Lewy body. So the cognitive profile, we we'll use different screening tests in the clinic to kind of give us an idea of which patients might have some cognitive impairments. And then that gives us an opportunity to do more in-depth neuropsych testing because they have a couple more hours to do more detailed tests and to figure out which domains in particular are affected because different uh, results on the test can help us localize back to that picture of the brain as to which lobe are we thinking is more affected. Um, so here's an example of uh, an Alzheimer's dementia sort of answers to some of these things versus a dementia with Lewy bodies. So we do clock drawing because it helps with our visual constructive abilities of, you know, how do they draw the circle? How are they organizing the numbers in there? Can they, are they neglecting one side of the clock? Some patients will only put it on half of the clock and not be aware of the other side of the clock. So with Alzheimer's, this is pretty well preserved. With dementia with Lewy bodies, you see all of the numbers are getting clumped on one side, the hands, you can't really tell which number it's going to. Similarly with copying a figure, we usually do two hexagons that are intersecting or pentagons that are intersecting. Alzheimer's, that's fairly well preserved versus the dementia with Lewy bodies, you get some scratches, but nothing that looks clearly like the intersecting pentagrams. And then, the MMSE is part of the uh, memory and recall. And so while this is much more affected in Alzheimer's disease, patients with Lewy body dementia, the memory, the recall is fairly well preserved. And similarly, orientation, which is recalling date, where they're at, those sorts of questions is more impacted with Alzheimer's versus dementia with Lewy bodies, especially early on will be more preserved. Uh, and again, short-term memory is going to be very much impacted in Alzheimer's, not as much in dementia with Lewy bodies. So um, with that too said that um, these are usually early on, sometimes as it progresses, some patients do have multiple protein abnormalities, multiple pathologies going on. And so if you have someone with DLB plus, you know, a stroke or plus some vascular, that's going to look slightly different. If you have someone who has both the alpha synucleinopathy as well as the amyloid abnormalities with Alzheimer's, then those patients tend to have more memory and language problems and their progression can be a little bit different than if it's just the pure Lewy body problem in particular. Another key feature for dementia with Lewy bodies is these patients have cognitive fluctuations. So unlike other dementias that which are fairly progressively worsening, Dementia with Lewy bodies has a lot of ups and downs. And so one day can be really good, next day can be terrible. It's, you know, never really predict how they're gonna do one day to the next. And these fluctuations can include staring off into space, being less responsive to family members or things going on around them. They may look lethargic or drowsy. Speech can often be slurred or really hard to understand. And then the patient will turn to be clear-headed, intelligible, almost back to normal. Uh, these episodes may last minutes. They can last days. These longer episodes in particular tend to be confused with strokes or seizures. And so especially early on, if you're not sure about the diagnosis or what's completely going on with the patient. Oftentimes these patients get brought into the emergency room or to doctors for more workup. And while part of the assessment is ruling out those things, we also wanna double check for infections, dehydrations and medications, which can cause kind of abrupt changes. But oftentimes patients with dementia with Lewy bodies don't have any of those other things going on. It's really just these fluctuations in their cognition is coming from the underlying disease process. And we don't have great treatments for that, unfortunately, is the big uh, problem. There's a couple of medications that we can use. And the big things that we try to emphasize is cognitive and physical training. So having structured activities throughout the day, trying to ha have you know, supervision or somebody with them provides more interaction and more stimulation throughout the day. 
is going to be better than them, you know, sitting at home while the caregiver is at work for half the day, they're napping on and off and off, on and off. And so you really get confused as to what time of day it is. Those tend to produce more cognitive problems for these patients. And then again, we want to identify any other medical comorbidities, which may be contributing. So for these patients, sleep apnea is a big one. Again, making sure they're getting consolidated sleep when they are able to go to bed. Uh, orthostatic hypotension. So again, if their blood pressure is dropping, you're not getting good blood flow up to the brain when you need it, then that can again cause a lot of slowing of cognition. Vascular risk factors as well. If we keep having you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol contributing to these little bits of brain not getting enough blood flow, that increases their risk of vascular dementia as well. Acetylcholine uh, esterates are inhibitors are our main medications used for Alzheimer's disease. Like things like denepacil or Aricept are used uh, specifically for that. It would be off-label for dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, but it's one that will always try. Uh, again, the rivastigmine is more supported by the randomized control studies because they've been done with Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies. They do have a modest effect. Uh, the benefit too with the rivastigmine is they come in both a pill as well as a patch. And so the patients who are having more troubles with swallowing or remember to take medications, you can put a patch on once a day and they don't have to worry about did they remember to take the dose or not. Uh, and denepazil, like I said, is only comes in a pill form, but they work in a very similar manner. Mementine or Nemenda is another Alzheimer's medication. Uh, it's kind of hit or miss since in dementia with Lewy bodies. There are some patients who get some benefit and others who don't really have much benefit. Some might worsen a little bit with it. And there's other, other medications which have been studied, but none of them are yet approved for specifically dementia with Lewy bodies. Right. Neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies are another big component of this disease. So most commonly is depression, about 30 to 40 percent of patients early in the disease, and it can be up to about two thirds of patients later on in the course. This is often causing more motor stability and lower quality of life for patients too on reported outcomes. So we try to treat this with medications and, and cognitive behavioral therapy if possible. Usually the combination is better than one alone, but sometimes you can only get patients to do one or the other. We've got both SSRIs or SNRIs, things like Zoloft, Prozac, fluoxetine. Uh, those tend to have less in the way of side effects compared to some of our tricyclic antidepressants, which are like Effexor, um, so amitriptyline or nortriptyline. Those tend to have more of the anticholinergic side effects, which can make the constipation worse, urinary symptoms worse, and even memory sometimes can be affected there. And then... Uh, usually our choice in which medication we use for depression is also looking at the whole patient to figure out, is there something else I can treat with just one medication rather than doing one pill for depression and another pill for, you know, pain or insomnia or weight loss. Uh, and so that's where we try to overlap as best we can with our choice of antidepressants. Apathy or lack of motivation is another big feature which may occur with depression or it can happen without any other symptoms of depression. Uh, again, the similar treatment with the antidepressants and the psychotherapy is the most helpful for this. Um, there are some small trials suggesting the rivastigmine, that anticholinesterase inhibitor, may be helpful, but there haven't been larger studies to kind of reproduce that and uh, make it kind of, you know, first line recommendation yet. Again, the structured uh, routines can also be helpful for this to some degree. Anxiety is another very common one. And so there's distinctions between anxiety, which is again, that feeling of panic or overwhelming heart racing versus akathisia is our term for just feeling restless or feeling like you've got to move. So some people might just feel restless without having any other underlying anxiety. And akathisia can come from if they're having motor symptoms and are on one of our dopamine medications, but that medication is wearing off. And so it's important for us to know because the treatment might be different if it's uh, one of those wearing off phenomenons. But about 30% of patients do have symptoms of anxiety and about one third of those would meet a criteria for one of the anxiety disorders. And so again, treatments are very similar to the depression and the apathy of the medications, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, similarly, the SSRIs or SNRIs are our first lines and buspirone or buspar in particular is one that tends to be very helpful for anxiety. 
And there is some potential benefit of can cannabinoids, again, due to kind of federal regulations on studies. We don't have specific studies for that, but kind of anecdotally, there have been a number of patients who kind of report, you know, a little bit of CBD helps a lot with the anxiety, which reduces some of the motor and the cognitive features, uh, symptoms. Other big things we stress to all of our patients to help with anxiety and depression is going to be exercise. Uh, other things like uh, mindfulness techniques can be learned through, again, cognitive behavioral therapy, or they may prefer to go through like a yoga instructor or another type of course. There's other online courses as well that are easily accessible. Other patients have also found that acupuncture can be very helpful. Again, getting insurance to cover it is more of the tricky part currently, but uh, again, there's been a number of studies, particularly in China and Japan, that have looked at the effects of those. And then hallucinations are one of the very typical classic portions of dementia with Lewy bodies. So these are spontaneous, well-formed visualizations of an object, people, animals. Um, so it might be, you know, there's someone in the room with me. There's this little girl who runs across the hallway. There's bats flying across the room or spiders crawling up the wall. Um, there are other types of hallucinations as well. So auditory hearing voices. Tactile is another one that we've had patients describe of like, I feel like there's a pin poking me or there's water being poured on me or I'm smelling something abnormal as well. And again, we usually double check that there's not actually something there, but some of it just might be hallucinations from the disease process. Uh, so hallucinations are slightly different than what we call illusions. Illusions are where there's actually something there, but they're mistaking that visual stimuli and seeing it as something else. So that can be like there's a curtain by the window and there's they think there's a person behind it, or there's a black backpack in the corner and they think it's a dog versus the hallucinations are there's absolutely nothing there. It's just completely made up by their brain. Uh, so early in the disease process, the patients may have some insight of, oh yeah, that's not real. But as the disease progresses, they can become more frightened or they can have a harder time distinguishing what's real versus what's uh, a hallucination. And that can be very problematic as they get you know, frightened by this thing, trying to you know, attack an intruder or run away from something and it becomes a safety hazard. So first treatment always is ruling out infection because that can create some of these problems. And then acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like denepazil or rivastigmine can help reduce or stop the hallucination. So that's usually something we'll add on first if they're not already on that. And then we look at their other medications. So are they on something like carbidopa, levodopa, or one of our other dopaminergic medications? Because that can bring out more of these hallucinations because dopamine works not only in the motor pathway, but also in the pathways that create these hallucinations. Um, of the medications that we call antipsychotics, there's only three that won't worsen the motor symptoms. They're walking and tremors, et cetera. So those would be quetiapine acerquil, clozaril, uh, and then pimavanserin or nuplazid. Uh, all of these do have a black box warning on them of you know, increased mortality uh, for patients with older patients with uh, psychosis. Granted, we, there's also other studies that look at, you know, treated psychosis versus untreated psychosis. And again, their mortality risk is lower if they're getting treatment versus if you're not treating it, their mortality risk is even higher. So it's kind of a weighing the risks benefits of like their risk of mortality often from not treating these is going to be higher than the risks from the medication itself. Typical neuroleptics, those are things like Haldol and Risperidone, which are used very commonly in patients with schizophrenia who are having hallucinations, are contraindicated because these patients, in addition to getting worsening of motor symptoms, can also have a hypersensitive reaction where they get irreversible slowing down or tremor as, or irreversible cognitive changes. And then there's also this, what we call neuroleptic malignant syndrome, where their body is like overheating and they need to be hospitalized and it can be really, really bad. Um, so it's a very specific thing to think about before we're starting these patients on a stronger medication for hallucinations. And then uh, delusions are, again, another definition here, beliefs that aren't based in reality, but persist even when they're presented with contrary evidence. Those can be things like paranoid delusions, thinking, you know, my spouse is cheating on me, my kids are, you know, 
uh, stealing things when I'm not there. Persecution is another type of you know, delusion where they're being you know, attacked, harassed, and, you know, the government is spying on me, those sorts of things. Somatic delusions are things that, about their own specific body. So obsession about, you know, there's something on my arm, I need to get it off and like picking at it obsessively, uh, even though there's nothing there. Or they can get uh, very tied into like timing of medications. If I don't take this, something bad will happen, et cetera. And again, looking for underlying medical problems is one of the first lines that we always do. And then they're treated the same way as hallucinations. So again, reducing the dopaminergics, adding a antipsychotic if they're getting problematic or dangerous for the patients. These are often, again, very difficult for patients and caregivers because there's nothing there. This shouldn't be an ongoing issue, but again, they're not going to believe anything that the family or caregivers are trying to say because it's a delusion. It's fixed. It's not going to go away oftentimes by outside influence. So really it's just trying to reassure the patients, being calm about it, trying to distract them. So trying to get them focused on something else. How about, you know, we switch rooms, go to do this other activity, try a different TV show, or let's do go on a walk together or something like that. Trying to argue or convince them to the contrary is just going to be a uh, essentially a fight, more frustration really on everybody's end and can make things a little bit worse. So it can be, again, very, very frustrating. So that's where we try and counsel a lot of, with the caregivers in particular. All right, and a little bit about the motor symptoms. So I've kind of hit a little bit on this as we've gone through, but specifically Parkinsonism is two of the four features, either tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. So you need at least two of those four in order to qualify for Parkinsonism. And Parkinson's disease tends to be really asymmetric in onset where it's really, you know, either left or right side is affected first, and it's always going to be more affected, even though the other side might start having some of those same symptoms, versus dementia with Lewy bodies tends to be more symmetric, where it's kind of bilateral tremor or bilateral slowness. Um, but again, there's always some exceptions to the rule. Those are kind of generalizations. The type of tremor that you see with Parkinson's is when they're at rest. So they're relaxing in the chair and then their hand is moving. Oftentimes it's what we call pill rolling is meaning the first two fingers are kind of going back and forth against each other for the most part. It can start with just a little bit of tremor as it progresses, it might get more affecting the whole hand or even uh, higher up in more joints in particular there can also affect the legs as well in the tremor. Rigidity is stiffness of the muscles, which can affect either the limbs or it can be the neck or the trunk. Uh, rigidity in the voice as well is what we term hypophonia or soft speech. And that's because again, these muscles and the vocal cords just aren't moving like they should be. They're more stiff. And then akinesia and bradykinesia. So akinesia is the difficulty in starting movement bradykinesia is the, as they're doing a movement, they slow down. And so this can be trouble getting out of chairs or out of the car uh, when they're walking, then all of a sudden they hit a point with, where they're freezing and can't keep moving forward. Uh, this also looks like decreased spontaneous movement. So as you probably see, I'm moving my hands when I'm talking. Parkinson's patients lose some of that spontaneous talking with their hands. The facial expressions aren't as expressive. You have more of a blank look on the face. Um, blinking slows down as well as swallowing. And so you can see patients having more drooling just because they're not automatically swallowing like they used to. Tips like using having something like gum or a hard candy in the mouth, something physical, helps with the swallowing. And then on the right hand side here is a, a picture of a U step walker, which again we use frequently for our Parkinsonian patients because it comes with other physical cues which are outside the body to help them with their walking. Things like a visual, like a laser line for them to step over. And then usually it also comes with like a metronome feature. Uh, so usually it's attached here, but then there's a button closer to the handle that you can hit where it'll cause like a, like a clicking sound, or again, like one, two, three steps, something external auditory or visual to help them get moving again uh, can help a lot with the freezing. The other thing we like about the U-step walker is again, you have to 
push or pull a handle in order to go so it won't run away from you if they let go and are falling. And if they are holding on to it, this base is also very, very stable. It provides a better center of gravity where the walker is not going to tip over with them because we've had lots of patients where, you know, they start falling, but the walker just kind of comes with them or lands on top of them and causes even more injuries. So this is more stable and better able to prevent injuries if they are uh, freezing more or having trouble with turns too. And then postural instability, again, another reason we use the U-step walker and that is imbalance. These patients are often very high fall risks. And so medications don't always help with the walking. Unfortunately, the best treatment we have really is physical therapy for balance and gait training. So making sure they're aware of how they're supposed to be walking, how they're supposed to be turning to do so safely. And then oftentimes, too, our patients with alpha-synuclein disorders get more rigid. And as they get more rigid in their trunk in particular, they get more stooping. And so you have to really stretch out those back muscles and strengthen those muscles every single day in order to help fight the abnormal posture that they're just really um, kind of forced into with that. So like I said, it's physical therapy and speech therapy. So the big and loud ones are specifically therapists who are trained to work with Parkinson's disease patients. And then, uh, so a little bit of what I was talking about. So this blue one is the motor pathways. So this is where we would add dopamine in order to treat some of the motor features. With the other problems though, is you get these mesolimbic mesocortical pathways of these are also dopamine related. And these are ones that are important in the formulation of hallucinations as well. Uh, and so you get uh, carbidopa levodopa is our mainstay of treatment to replace dopamine. It can, again, help the movements, but can worsen some of the other features. And again, that's working at this kind of cellular level. We're trying to increase the amount of dopamine available to stimulate the receptors to uh, relay the information that we're trying to, to fix. And then a couple other highlights on medical and psychosocial issues. So patients with alpha-synuclein disorders often have REM sleep behavior disorder. So this is a loss of the normal paralysis during sleep. And so it's not just our alpha-synuclein disorders. It can also be seen with other types of cerebellar degeneration. If patients have sleep apnea, which isn't being treated, this can also occur. And there's some medications and other conditions which can similarly produce this, but most of the time there's some underlying disorder. So we counsel our patients and their partners on, you know, bedroom safety. If the patient's, you know, swinging, punching, kicking, and they can, you know, grab something off the bedside table and throw it and hurt somebody or um, fall out of bed, making sure there's bed rails, things that will try and keep them as safe as possible. We've had patients too who, you know, sleep with like a gun in the bedside table and it's like, let's move that as far away as possible, keep it locked, separate from ammunition, making sure that there's no accidents that are occurring when you're not fully aware of what's going on. Melatonin and clonazepam are the other medications that we'll use if these are, you know, persistent or bothersome or creating issues as well. Then autonomic dysfunction, similarly, like we talked a little bit earlier, if there's blood pressure control, gut motility, sweating, heart rates, pupil constriction, salivation, there's other features that are usually under subconscious control. The autonomic system just takes care of all of these functions. But with the Lewy bodies infiltrating those nerves and creating dysfunction, you start getting all of these other things affected. And so it's a little less common with our dementia with Lewy bodies patients compared with Parkinson's or our multi-system atrophy patients. But we usually will still screen for all of these things on follow-ups because if they occur, they can be very dangerous. If they're you know, getting too constipated, you end up with an obstruction or an impaction, then you need to go to the hospital for that. That ends up worsening uh, our patient's condition as they get delirious and are in a new environment and it disrupts their structured um, environment, which is very important for their well-being. Or again, if they're getting really low blood pressure when they're standing and falling and injuring themselves, breaking a hip or hitting their head, then again, that sets them back significantly. All right, so a little bit on end of life care and planning. So currently we have no cure for any of our alpha-synuclein disorders, but that's part of what we're constantly working on. And there's some medications that we're trying potentially in the pipeline. And again, making patients and family aware that these are progressive. So 
taking a look at where the patient is now and realizing the patient's going to need additional assistance with times. That comes with you know, cognitive things like being able to manage their own finances, taking their own medications, organizing their pillbox, driving safely, uh, mobility as well against so potentially needing the walker or the wheelchair or uh, being bed bound to some degree later in the course. Swallowing too uh, can potentially be affected with the Parkinsonism if it's affecting these vocal muscles and swallowing muscles as well, or if the dementia and the cognitive you know, understanding of how do I eat appropriately, et cetera those things can also feed into it as well. And so it's very important for patients to discuss kind of, you know, preferences, what is a good quality of life, what are things that would be acceptable or not acceptable to them early on, while they can still have those coherent conversations with family is very important, so that it comes a time when they're incapacitated due to illness or progression of the disease, families on the same page about like, no, this is something that they not would have not wanted, or yes, this is still in line with what they would have wanted if this were the case. Individual courses, again, may vary based on if they have underlying heart disease or diabetes or other medical conditions, but on average, patients with dementia with Lewy bodies live to, from about five to eight years uh, with the uh, dementia portion of it. There are patients who have lived up to maybe 20, but again, usually it's more of this rapid progressive course compared to Parkinson's, which can be decades before they start getting the cognitive impairments or other impairments. And so big parts of planning for the future are building a support team. So that looks like people to talk to. Having that interaction with other people is important. That can be, you know, counselors, friends, religious leaders, support groups, um, and then planning out who's going to be doing care. Is this someone who is living alone and by themselves right now? Do they have family who's going to be able to be involved when they're needing, you know, a driver to get to appointments or someone to live at the house if they're waking up in the middle of the night confused? Or is this something where that you're going to be able to hire caregivers from a association nearby? Or is this going to be if I'm needing more help, I'm going to have to move into a nursing home sort of situation. Local resources as well, it's important to know about them even before they're needed. So these are things like uh, Meals on Wheels or other places that can provide home care, meals, respite care too for, you know, if family needs a break for a vacation or something else that they need, just someone to come in briefly, what's available in the local community. Um, also, to knowing that you're trying to plan for the future, talking to legal and financial experts is important for these patients. So are they young? Are they applying for disability or maybe taking early retirement because they're not able to function at the level required to do their work? Um, making sure that they have a living will and advanced directives and all of the legal paperwork lined up to, okay, who is making decisions in the case that they can't voice what they want done for them, what financially is going to be possible, and again, kind of planning for the, if we're going to need to hire caregivers or plan for a maybe more assisted living, financially, how are we going to fit that into the, the budget and plan for that as well, so... And then safety is another key feature here too, again, because motor is involved as well as the cognitive and understanding portion of it. So understanding that homes will likely need modifications. So things like grab bars, especially in the bathroom where there's lots of hard surfaces, which can lead to injuries, removing loose rugs and tripping hazards, trying to widen areas so that there's access for a walker or a wheelchair. Uh, and then good lighting too, because again, if you aren't seeing the hazards, you're gonna have even more difficulty with them. Medical alert services are also really important. So, you know, the things that they can push if they have a fall, if there's no one there with them. Uh, driving evaluations, this is another big one of patients want to be driving as long as possible because they want to maintain independence, but that might not always be in their best interest safety-wise. Uh, so there's options for occupational therapy or having these evaluations where we have some hard and fast evidence of like, no, your reaction time really isn't that good. And so we do not recommend that you drive because of you know, X, Y, Z versus trying to convince them without some of that is a bit more difficult. Uh, then the there's a good website, the Lewy Body Dementia Association. Uh, they have wallet cards available where if 
you know, they are wandering and get lost somewhere or um, are out by themselves. And they have family and doctor contact information as well as, you know, what's going on. That way there's a little bit more information for uh, responders or medical staff who are trying to help them in that situation. And then again, kind of having those early discussions with family and caregivers as to what they're able to do at the home and what's safe versus when they might need, you know, a memory care facility. Uh, you know, is it at the point where, you know, we can't handle the constant uh, bowel or bladder incontinence that sometimes comes late in the course of dementia is where that's where we need to make that transition. Or again, the walking you're falling too frequently and we just can't keep you at home. And what point would you say, okay, we need to maybe transition from where we're at to a different level of care. And another thing to kind of consider, so again, we mentioned a little bit about swallowing can become impaired because of both Parkinson'sm as well as the dementia. And with adults with advanced dementia, uh, hand feeding has been shown to be as good as tube feeding for the outcomes of death, aspiration, pneumonia, functional status and comfort. And tube feeds can be associated with higher agitation, greater use of physical and chemical restraints and healthcare use due to tube related com Applications and development of new pressure ulcers. So oftentimes when someone's having difficulty swallowing, you talk about, do we need a tube into the stomach or through the mouth to help with you know, feeding in these times? But really in advanced stages of dementia, we don't recommend the use of tube feeds. It's more just, again, letting them eat what they want as long as it's, it's safe and having some supervision is the big thing in that regard. It's not like a stroke where, again, the swallowing might get better if we just give it a little bit more time in rehab. This is something that's going to be progressive. And then we try to emphasize enjoying daily life with our patients. So making lists of things that they enjoy that are still important to them, maximizing time with loved ones. Sometimes too, it's helpful to have lists of favorite music or songs for play, things to have on in the background while they're going through all of this, again, helps provide extra stimulation. If you're moving from one location to another, having a memory book with pictures or other favorite mementos to help is easy to you know, transport from one place to another. Exercise, time outdoors, again, help with mood and that day-night regulation as well. And then practicing gratitude is another one that can sometimes really be helpful. Like there's probably a lot that's gonna be ter like difficult or hard at times, but picking out, you know, a thing or two each day to be thankful for can help with some of that mood regulation and everything that you're and coping as you're going through all of this. So that goes through a little bit of their entry to dementia, symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies, and some of the considerations for end of life care here. Uh, any questions as well? We're not able to unmute today, but you're certainly welcome to use the chat room to ask Dr. Sipma any questions you may have. And I, I don't think I could keep a list of, it was so much information that was so actionable and interesting. And I thought I knew this topic, but I did not realize the depth that you would share with us. And I'm most appreciative as I know everyone else is. Well, thank you. Now, again, there's lots of nuances to these things that might not be aware of until you're actually dealing with it, either with a loved one or in the clinical setting. So, uh, Ms. Calder says, this was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Ms. Vincent says, wonderful information. Thank you for the information. Ms. Roberts, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Ms. Melton says, thank you so much. And I thank you as well. We're really at the end of the hour, if you can believe it. That went by quickly. Thank you so much, Dr. Sipman. I, you know, I've offered to you before a, a standing offer, and, and it, it, it's, it exists. You're always welcome. It's so informative when you speak with us, and I appreciate you for doing it. Ms. Bird said she learned a lot, and Ms. Durs has said great info. Thank you for joining today. I always enjoy coming and helping spread what I've been learning over the years as well. Oh, I know you do. That's why we love having you. Ms. Talbert says, great presentation, very informative. Ms. Polk says, one of the best dementia presentations I've ever heard. And Ms. Hinton says, thank you. On their positive notes and your positive energy, Dr. Sitma, I'll release us from today. Thank you again. I do look forward to seeing you and having you speak again if you so choose and would like to do so and uh, for those of you who like to join us please join us on monday when uh, dr nicole brown doctor of social work presents to us 
PTSD. Uh, this is in honor, I believe, this month of Mental Health Month. Maybe that was last month, but PTSD is a topic for Monday. Uh, check our website to register, or if you're on an email list, you have a registration. So many thank yous pouring in. Thank you to sit close to home. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. We look forward to the chance to be with you all again.